Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Do you want your lathe to cut straight? If so, you got to get the bed straight, and you got to get the tailstock aligned. And we're going to do both right now. So the other day, I'm working on this part that needs to be 500 thou in diameter, so I measure it in the middle, and I'm a couple tenths off. Pretty happy with that. To keep myself honest, I measure the tailstock end. It's about half a thou over. And then I measure the chuck end, and it's almost a full thou under. So I'm turning about a thou and a half of taper here over about four inches. That's no good. So I'm going to show you how to take taper out of your parts, but uh, when do you need to do this kind of setup? Well, anytime you get a new machine, of course, you need to go through this exercise, uh, or anytime you move the machine, uh, you're going to need to do this as well. And in my case, you know, this machine's been sitting here uh, happily cutting straight for many years, but you know, things in the environment change. Concrete settles, uh, steel benches can shift, uh, cast iron in the machine itself can settle. So something you know, has changed in the environment. It doesn't take much uh, for the machine to, to start cutting tapers. There are two basic things that can introduce taper into the part from the machine itself. The first is twist in the bed and the second is misalignment of the tailstock from the spindle. Now, of course, the alignment of the tailstock depends on the flatness of the bed, so we have to check the flatness of the bed first. Here's a little arts and crafts project to demonstrate how twist in the ways creates taper. So here's our stock here, and here's our little tool post here. And uh, watch what happens when I twist one end of the ways. So pay attention to the distance between the tool and the stock right there. Now, when I twist one end here, you can see that the distance between the tool and the stock changes. So if the near side of the tailstock is tilted down, the tool gets further away from the stock. And so that end of the stock is going to be larger and the machine is going to turn a taper or a cone, if you like. And here's another view on that. So you can see now this is obviously very exaggerated. We're talking about, you know, microscopic amounts of twist here on the real machine. But how do we measure twist in something like this? It turns out to be really hard to do because the bed here, the ways, is the reference on the machine. So if this thing isn't straight, we have no reference to compare anything else on the machine to. Luckily, we have one handy universal reference for all of this stuff, the earth. Machinists often talk about leveling your lathe and how important that is. It's actually not true. A lathe doesn't have to be level. Any Navy machinist will tell you they bolt lathes to the decks of ships and they work just fine. However, what we're doing is we're using level as a proxy for measuring twist in the bed. So what we do is we measure level down here and we measure level up here. And if this guy is kind of here and this guy is kind of here, that's going to show up as different level positions. And then that you can see is going to tell us if there's twist in the bed. Now, of course, we're talking about microscopic amounts of twist here. So how do we measure that? Now, I happen to know my machine is level already, but I'm going to give you a crash course in this just so you can see how it's done. Now, we're talking properly level, not like woodworker level, but like properly machinist level. So how do we measure that? It's okay, I can make those jokes. My best friend is a woodworker. This is a typical machinist level. Whoop. It works very similar in principle to the basic carpenter or DIY level, but of course it has some very important differences. Uh, the first is cost. Uh, these things are not cheap. Uh, they are extremely high precision instruments. Uh, you can, however, find them on eBay. That's where I got this guy, but be careful. Make sure that, uh, you know, it's in good condition, especially check the bottom surface that there's no damage or wear or anything on there and, uh, you know, buyer beware, but you can save a lot of money buying these guys on eBay. The second important difference, of course, is precision. These tick marks here are five thousandths of an inch per foot or 0.5 millimeters per meter. So that's the sensitivity, give or take, of this guy. And uh, so it's extremely sensitive. And the other important feature of these guys is that they are self-proving. You can adjust one end of it. And then the bottoms of them, of course, are precision ground, and they have a V in them to minimize contact surface for increased precision. And uh, to that end, uh, you want to try and minimize how much you handle these guys because the temperature of your hands can actually warm it up and change the readings. Step one is to calibrate it. So we start with a clean and dry surface plate. Get everything clean. Now, because we know the surface plate is a perfect plane in principle, there will be some orientation on it that is level. Wherever you place it might not be level, depends how the bench is sitting and how the stone is sitting on the bench and so on, but there will be some rotation of this thing that is perfectly level. So just rotate this guy until you find that point. And then what we do is we take something that's a precision straight edge, something heavy so it won't move. 
give it a little extra mass here behind it, like so. And then we rotate the level 180 degrees and it should have the same reading. And if it doesn't, then adjust the thumb screws here up and down a little bit until it reads the same in both orientations. And you might have to change the position on the plate as you go, but uh, as soon as you get it to a position where it reads the same in both directions, then it is self-proved and calibrated. Then what we want to do is place the level on the far end of our ways. And to do that, the ways, of course, have to be completely clean and dry. You need two matching flat spots on your ways. On some machines, this is easy. On others, it's a little tricky. Uh, this is what's often called a prismatic ways, where there's multiple trapezoidal sections at different heights. But there are two flat spots here that are at the same height and in the same plane and ostensibly. So we need to be able to put our level on these guys, but of course the prismatic sections are in the way. So we can put some sort of precision blocks on the flat spots. Now these have to be precision blocks. Ideally you want to use gauge blocks for this because those are precision ground and extremely precise. Uh, I'm using these one, two, three blocks here that I've checked and I know that they're good. These are quality one, two, three blocks. But uh, obviously if these two blocks aren't exactly the same height, then this whole exercise is moot. So be very careful which blocks you use. And then we just place our level line here and we look at our reading right there. And we do the same thing down here. And what you want is the same reading at both ends. So we need to twist this end of the ways slightly to get those two uh, bubbles to be in the same position. And uh, so if you've got a, a large machine with feet on it, then uh, those feet are going to be adjustable. And that's how you do this. Uh, on a small benchtop machine like this, we achieve twist adjustment by putting shims under the front or back of the cast iron feet that are down there. Now all that fancy measuring just gets us in the ballpark. Yes, machinists have very small ballparks. What is this, a ballpark for ants? But the truth is always in the cut. So to really get the machine dialed in, you need to make a test bar. To make this test bar, I'm using a piece of one inch steel and uh, you, you want generally to use the thickest bar that will fit through your spindle bore to make it easier to work with, but you want it to be as thick as possible so that uh, it will support its own weight with a large overhang as we will see here. So I'm going to face the end of that off and then we're going to put a center in it with a number two center drill and uh, take care to make this center as clean and nice as possible. Make sure there's no chatter in it. And then we're going to pull this bar out to about there. So this is six inches of extension, which is good for a bench top lathe. And then we bring the tailstock in and square up the tool post. And then we're just going to do a light cleanup pass on this thing, just like 10,000, something like that is enough, just so that we have a concentric surface there. And then I'm going to come in here with a grooving tool and I'm going to make a little trench at one end, about half an inch from the end. And that end is going to form basically a journal. So I'm cutting that little trench in there at each end and again leaving about a half inch at the far end and then we turn down the middle between those journals. So we're making a barbell shape and the center diameter is about 30 or 40 thou smaller than the ends. Uh, the smaller you make that center area the more tries you'll get for the adjustments that we're going to make but if you make it too small you're going to lose rigidity so 30 or 40 thou is kind of a good compromise. Next we want to make sure our turning tool is really nice and sharp so I'm honing it by hand. You have to get a very very good finish on the operations that we're about to do here. And then we pull the tailstock out and then we start turning. And I know what you're saying, this is madness. You can't possibly turn stock with that much overhang. This is way way beyond the recommended limit of two to three times the diameter of the stock. But you see we have to do this without tail support because if the tailstock is in place that's establishing the axis of the part but we need to measure how the tool travels across the ways relative to the spindle. And so that's why we do this without tail support. And the reason that we made that barbell shape is because we only want to be doing cutting at the very ends. And uh, that minimizes uh, buildup of heat in the part, which would change the dimension, and uh, also minimizes tool wear between cutting one journal and the other, so that uh, the cutting conditions at each end of this bar are as similar as possible. That's really important. And uh, the way we get away with this much overhang is that we're cutting very, very, very light passes, like two thousandths at the max. And you may still encounter some chatter. And if, if you get chatter even with a two thou cut, then uh, your, your test bar is a little bit too long. 
So uh, as I said, with a one inch bar, about six inches of overhang, we can get away with and do a two thou cut with no chatter. So now what we do is a series of two thou passes at each end and uh, we're using the power feed for the cutting at the ends, but then we're uh, just hand cranking in between to speed up the process. And you need to get to a point where you get a full cleanup pass at both ends in this setup. And uh, that tech, it can be a little hard to tell with such a, a shallow cut if you're actually cleaning up the entire surface. So just put some Sharpie uh, marker on there and now you can tell if after your pass uh, there's no Sharpie marker left and you know it was a full cleanup. And uh, once you get to the point where you've got a full cleanup pass at both ends, then now we know we're measuring the true straightness of the ways from here on out and we can start taking measurements. So now I measure the far end and I take this measurement repeatedly until I get the same reading three times and I'm using a tenths micrometer here because ultimate precision is very important here. So I make a note of that measurement and then I do the same thing at the near end and now we can see where we're at. I'm just using the last digits on the micrometer here. So I've got 2.7 at one end and 2.0 at the other. So the chuck end is 7 tenths larger. So again, referencing our toothpick model, that means that the tool is too close to the work at the tailstock end. So I want to tilt the back of the tailstock end of the ways up a little bit. So I start by unbolting it from the bench. And then I come in on the back and I pry it up off the bench and I slide a shim under there. So it's uh, quite hard to know what size shim to use, so just start with something round. I'm starting with a 10 thou shim here, and uh, you're going to need an, ass an assortment of precision shim stock. So you can either uh, dismantle an old uh, feeler gauge, or you can buy uh, packs of assorted shim stock, which uh, I'll include in the description below. And don't push that shim all the way under the foot, or you'll never get it out again. And uh, now you can bolt the machine back down to the bench, and we can take another test cut and see where we're at. And once again, we do clean up passes until we're cutting cleanly on both ends. So after that first attempt, we're 1.1 at this end, uh, actually 1.0 after double checking that, and we're 0.4 at the other end. So we're actually now 6 tenths larger at the tailstock end. So this tells us two things. First, that we went in the correct direction, the tailstock end got bigger. Uh, but uh, we actually went too far by about 100%. So that was a 10 thou shim, so we'll take that out. And uh, I actually went back and forth a couple of times. I went to a 5 thou, and then you know, I experimented with 1 and 3 thou shims and uh, did a few iterations that I will spare you here, but uh, this is the process. So after a few iterations of that, I managed to get 20.5 at both ends. Uh, this actually surprised me, I didn't quite believe it, but here is the measurement, 20 and 5 tenths at both ends. So both ends are the same size within my ability to measure a tenth on the micrometer that I have over a distance of uh, 4 or 5 inches. So very happy with that. Now we need to align the tailstock. The quickest way to do this is with something called a tailstock alignment bar, and it's a very high precision ground bar that you put between centers and you just put an indicator on each end and you adjust your tailstock until the indicators read the same. Now, these bars cost money and you may not have one and they're a very specialty item that isn't worth owning unless you adjust your tailstock a lot. So I'm going to show you the old school method. So we bring the tailstock back in and if you need to deepen your recess, this is a good time to do that. So I gave myself another 30 thou. And what we can do is pull this bar out a little bit and part it off because the next step needs to be done turning between centers. So we have to put a center in the far end. Now, hey, hey what you doing there, Quinn? Why are you parting it off so close to that journal? We need room for the lathe dog to turn this between centers. No, wait, no, stop, what? No, oh, Yahtzee, I guess. Well, luckily, I just installed the new Tony OS so I can just Command Z that to undo it. Because, uh, boy, it sure would be annoying if I had to make that part again just for this video. Yep, that sure would be annoying. But luckily I didn't have to do that. Anyway, we go ahead and set up for turning between centers here. So we put uh, a uh, lathe drive pin in there, which this is a, something that I made uh, for this lathe. And then we put our big center in there. And then the tailstock center. And I'm using a uh, high pressure grease here. You'll note that I've put in the dead center there because I don't want to use a live center and introduce more variables for this process. So going old school with the grease in the dead center. And I also put some counterweights on the uh, drive dog end there just to uh, make it run as smoothly as possible. So now we do the same process that we did for the previous test bar and uh, make sure that we're getting cleanup cuts before we go any further all the way across both journals. And uh, you'll notice some run out in the recessed center of the bar because of course that center was turned inside the chuck and now we're turning between centers on a different center. 
but that doesn't matter because we're recutting the journal areas. And once we've got a full cleanup, then we know the journals are concentric with our centers. And once again, we take measurements at both ends. And again, I'm triple checking each measurement. So uh, to start with, we've got 20.4 at one end and we've got 20.9 at the other. So we are half a thou small at the tailstock end with tail support in place. So then we set up a indicator on the quill and uh, Ideally, you would do this with a tenths indicator. I don't have one. They're very expensive. So uh, I've got a half thou indicator and this is good enough for uh, the shenanigans that go on in my shop. The lateral position of the tailstock is adjusted with these bolts in the base that work against each other. So you loosen one and tighten the other. So since our tailstock end was half a thou too big, we want to move the tailstock backwards about half that distance because we're measuring diameter so we want to move it a quarter of a thou so that's halfway between two of the lines on my budget half thou indicator so after that first move we've got 18.9 at the tailstock end and 19.9 at the chuck end so we uh, moved it the wrong direction because our half thou problem turned into a one thou problem so even if you think uh, about that toothpick model when you're doing this, it can sometimes still be unintuitive a little bit. So yeah, and we just do it again and go the other way. But uh, the good thing is we saw an expected result. It moved the uh, diameter amount that we expected. So that we know that uh, our setup here is correct. We just got to do it the other way. And uh, it may take more fooling around on each of these moves than you expect because everything here is in tension. The screws are tight against each other. And as you start to loosen things, you can get spring effects uh, that kind of things start to relax. So the indicator may move in unexpected ways when you first start making each move. So sometimes you have to mess with these screws back and forth a couple of times. But the important thing is to believe the indicator and keep going until the indicator reading is what you want it to be for your next test. So that got us to 16 at the tailstock end and 15.8 at the chest end so we're two tenths large on the tailstock now so a couple more iterations and I got to 14.4 at the tailstock end and 14.4 oh let's call that 48 at the chuck end so 14.48 and 14.4 so we're eight hundred thousandths large at the chuck end over about six inches. I'm pretty very happy with that. You can drive yourself crazy chasing hundredths. Uh, so we're gonna live with that. And uh, you can keep this bar for future use next time you have to adjust your tailstock. But the real proof is in the production. So then I went back to making that part I was trying to make when this all started. And again, I took three measurements and uh, all three measurements are dead nuts on 14 and nine tenths. So now I can no longer detect any taper within the resolution of my tools. So very happy with that result. I hope this helps you align your lathe. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.